and I am a retired veteran homeschool mom. And I have children who have dyslexia. How many of you feel like your children might be dyslexic? Okay, hands went up quick for that one. <laughs> How, what are the reasons, if you don't feel like your child might be dyslexic, that you decided to come here today? In the middle of the room, would you mind sharing? Yeah. Oh, well, the school board for the for our private school here, and there's children in our school that are dyslexic. Oh, excellent. So you want to help other people succeed the best they can. Fabulous. That's wonderful. Love that. Okay, and my final question, how familiar are you with Orton Gillingham? Just heard the name and curious to learn more. If that's you, raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are familiar with the term and you want to really understand the difference? Okay. And then finally, never heard of it before. Okay. So, Orton Gillingham is the key of what we're going to talk about today. However, dyslexia and Orton Gillingham go hand in hand. So we will be talking about dyslexia as well. We're going to cover dyslexia, me, why I am an expert in dyslexia, the solutions to dyslexia, and the principles and benefits of Gordon Gillingham instruction. My name is Jess Arce. I'm a best-selling author. I wrote the book, I Am Not Dumb, I Am Dyslexic. And I also have compiled um, lots of inspirational quotes because I feel it's very important to build the self-esteem of dyslexic people. And I am dyslexic myself. As I said, I'm a veteran homeschool mom. I started homeschooling my kids in 2011 and discovered that I needed to learn a different way to teach my youngest son because he was diagnosed with dyslexia when we were living in Texas. And as was my daughter, both of them received Horton Gillingham based services in school and my son's teacher said, if you're going to be homeschooling, you need to teach him in the way he would learn best. Well, if I'm going to spend the time teaching my kids at home, let me do it right. My daughter had years of being taught wrong before we figured out she was dyslexic. And lo and behold, I married a dyslexic as well. So we didn't know either of us were dyslexic until I started tutoring my own kids. And everything started to make sense once we knew. And then finally, as I said, I have four children. I've not said that part yet, but three of my four have dyslexia. One of them has profound dysgraphia, and they have a total of nine neurodiversities between my four children. I like to say neurodiversities are kind of like cousins and they like to hang out with each other. <laughs> So many people will ask, well, if my child has ADHD, can they also have something else? Absolutely. Also, I forgot to mention, I have been working with dyslexic individuals and families since 2012. So that gives me a very broad spectrum of my knowledge of dyslexia. Having been dyslexic myself, I was held back in third grade because I couldn't read. My mother was told I had a reading disability. She was a public school teacher diagnosed with dyslexia in the 40s and had no clue what dyslexia looked like in other people. She couldn't identify it in me. She couldn't identify it in my daughter who I spent 10 years trying to figure out why my child couldn't cut the scissors, couldn't draw stick figures, couldn't spell the word cat. My daughter has profound dyslexia. There's varying degrees of dyslexia. My family, my husband and my daughter have profound dyslexia. My son, not quite as profound. I would say I'm moderate. So after I was called back in third grade, 
I received or he only had instructions. We didn't know that's what it was called, but that had to have been what I received because that year I went from not being able to read to being able to read. And I went to private school. So after being held back, I went to a different private school and got skipped to fifth grade. So I was never in fourth grade. But because of my now ability to read, and as you all I'm sure are aware, most dyslexics are of average or above average intelligence. So now that I could read, I could keep up with my, with my peers in the other areas of learning. Now, fast forward really far, when I was looking at a high school, they wouldn't accept me because they, they said I wasn't college material. Still didn't know I was dyslexic. Um, so I'll prove them wrong. <laughs> Ended up going to an accelerated high school and graduated a year early and went to college at 16. Wow. So, you know, that's one of the things about dyslexic people is oftentimes we struggle a lot so that we are really resilient. We're able to figure out ways to thrive in life. And my husband who when I tutored him, was only reading on a fifth grade reading level before I tutored him. Um, he, before that, was making a quarter of a million dollars a year as a mortgage lender. I ended up tutoring him because he couldn't, after 2008, they required a test, a state test. Well, if any of you know this, the average student graduates high school on an eighth grade reading level. So that's the way all of our tests are on an eighth grade reading level, all of the, you know, big tests. Um, so he couldn't pass the mortgage exam, he took it three times. So he was like, please tutor me. So I started tutoring him and within 15 months, he was reading on a ninth grade reading level and passed the test. So it doesn't matter how old your child is. Yes, early intervention is great. And it really builds the self-esteem of the child. I feel like that's the biggest advantage of the early intervention because the older they get, even when they're homeschooled, they compare themselves with their peers, they compare themselves with their siblings, and so that's the biggest challenge of individuals who are older. However, in my experience with tutoring students for the last 13 years is the older students learn much quicker. The younger students, it takes them longer to get through the Horton Gillingham program. So, yes, early intervention is ideal. And if you have a seven-year-old, great, perfect. But if you have a 17-year-old, it's not too late. Don't feel like it's hopeless because it is not hopeless, okay? All right, so let's talk about what dyslexia is. This is the scientific definition of dyslexia. I am not into science. So I'm gonna tell you the layman's version of dyslexia. Dyslexia is difficulty with words. Dys means not, lexia means words. That's literally what it is. It's a difficulty with reading words. It's a difficulty with spelling words. It's a difficulty with writing words and or it's a difficulty with communicating words. So not everyone is going to have the same challenges. I just talked to a mom today and her daughter is an avid reader. She said her daughter reads a book a day, but she can't spell at all. When we really started digging into it, she said maybe her daughter's not the best reader. She skims over words she doesn't really know. She's in 11th grade, or going into 11th grade. But because she's bright, she's able to figure out enough of the information in front of her that she can be a good reader. So a lot of times people will assume that you need to have reading challenges to be dyslexic. That is not true. I had a student once who, he was diagnosed with autism at age two, so that's all they ever paid attention to was his 
autism. And finally, the mom went, you know, he was getting an IEP, he was getting services for everything except for his dyslexia. And so she used her charter funds to pay for his tutoring because no one would address his dyslexia because he could read well. I would have to tell this boy when he was reading to me, slow down, because he read faster than I could keep up with him. But he couldn't spell until we finished working together. You know, so that is something really important to keep in mind. Another really big thing I see way too often is most people think dyslexia is reversing letters and numbers. That is not dyslexia. I repeat, reversals are not dyslexia. Reversals can be a couple of things. One is the individual hasn't had time to mature. Their brain hasn't had enough time to learn left to right. And an example of this is, I'm sure all of you have experienced this. I know I have. At nighttime, when I'm tired, sometimes I'll reverse my piece of knees. I don't do it when I'm at my prime in the beginning of the day, but my brain is, is already ready to start shutting down, and so then it's not working as hard. And that's a very common thing. That's why a lot of times in school, they'll say, wait until the student's in third grade if they have reversal issues before they start giving them help because they want to give them time. Second reason for reversals is uh, a vision problem. So for my youngest son, I tutored him. He's the reason I am standing here today. By 10th grade, he was reading on an 11th grade reading level. However, he was still reversing half of the alphabet and several numbers. So we went to vision therapy. And a year and a half later, he didn't reverse his letters anymore. His, his um, optic vision was, was weak. And the, the doctor asked me, she said, can you see this? It should look like this. I said, no, I can't see that. She said, well, you probably have it too. I probably do. Because one time I almost killed my mother and I driving down the five freeway in Los Angeles. There, I think there was like seven rows of lanes and I only saw five. And so I was ready to cut over and we almost got plummeted and then all of a sudden I saw it. But so I don't always trust my peripheral vision. So that's one reason, or a second reason why someone might reverse things. And then a third reason is scotopic syndrome. It's also called Erlen syndrome. Very common, much more common than people realize. And most teachers don't even know what it is, although, they do use tools associated with it. So um, when my daughter was in school, they gave her a blue overlay. And that is what helps with the top of the syndrome. It doesn't have to be blue. But blue is the most common color. You can go on Erlen.com and see what color works best for your child. My husband, blue is his best color. My son, Green is his best color. I've had a student who orange was her best color and a student who pink was her best color. The best thing is not to give your kids white paper with black background if they have scotopic syndrome. And for your students, it would be ideal if you could use cream colored paper rather than white paper because it, it's easier on the eyes. It's much softer. and. So also if, if you have a child who um, words move on the page, they see double. I had a student who he read better upside down than right side up. Turned out two of his uncles also experienced that. That is scotopic syndrome. So that is something that's very often associated with dyslexia. And it has become, that's what people think dyslexia is. And a lot of times parents don't get their kids the help they need because their child doesn't reverse or their child doesn't struggle with spelling. So those are two important things to keep in mind.
So, challenges associated with dyslexia. Decoding words, that's the biggest challenge, right? Breaking them apart into the smallest sound. Spelling, really hard. I think that is what all dyslexic people struggle with. But maybe not, maybe there's a few that don't. But spelling is the biggest issue I've seen in my family, in my students, not being able to figure out the vowel sound perhaps, or just guessing. Maybe they can't spell the word girl. Things like that. Reading comprehension, grammar and punctuation. Handwriting can also be a huge complaint of parents. Problems with math, symbols, and challenges with verbal expression. Working memory. That's something I have battled with. I'm, I'm in Toastmasters, we do speeches. I have the hardest time memorizing my speeches. I've just gotten to a point where I just make sure I talk about what I know about, and then I don't have to have a speech I memorize. Um, focusing on tasks, time management, challenges with writing, those are just a few of the academic challenges. And then we've got the other challenges that come from these academic challenges. Being, having a low self-esteem or low confidence, anxiety and frustration, social difficulties such as peer relationships, avoidance of reading and writing, fatigue from reading, writing, schoolwork in general. There's lots of challenges that are associated with dyslexia. Some people may have different ones than others. So these two people, Dr. Orton and Ms. Gillingham, are the founders of the Orton-Gillingham program. And Dr. Orton was a neurologist and a psychiatrist. And he studied the brain. And he met a man who was a successful businessman who couldn't read. And he wanted to know why this man could not read. And so that became his life work, literally. And Anna Gillingham was a teacher and a psychologist. And she studied words and the root of words and she dedicated her career to learning differences or learning disabilities, particularly dyslexia. And she was an expert in teaching reading and language skills to struggling students. And she wrote a book before her and Dr. Orton created the Orton-Gillingham program. So the two of them met in the 1930s. And they met at the Neuro Neurological Institute of New York. And they realized they had a common interest. And so they decided to use her knowledge of education and the English language and his knowledge of the brain and create the Horton Gillingham program. And that program has been around since the 1930s. Okay, so that's almost 100 years. Most people will say, oh, they didn't know about dyslexia 20 years ago. They did. They knew about dyslexia over 100 years ago. It used to be called a word or something. I can't remember. But it wasn't called dyslexia. He coined the name dyslexia. And before it was called word something, it had some really long scientific name. Like I said, my mother was diagnosed with dyslexia in the 1940s. So it has been something that they've known about for a very long time. And one of the things is the educational system didn't want to have to provide special ed services for dyslexia. So they did extensive research since 1979. However, they did not share that information with the general public because they didn't want to have to pay for one in five students to receive services. Unfortunately, our children have suffered the consequences of this. 
Now, I really think it's because of the internet that we have made so much headway because parents know so much more than they did when I was raising my kids. And it's harder to keep things hidden when everything is available on the internet now. So six principles of Orton Gillingham instruction are very important to come up with the program that we have. And phonological awareness is the key because dyslexic people usually lack phonological awareness. Phonological awareness is sounds. So the smallest sound is a phenome. And many dyslexic people don't enunciate their sounds correctly. My husband, that was one of his biggest challenges. And he used to say, oh, it's because English is my second language. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I've met a lot of people who, English is their second language, but they were raised in America, who don't struggle with the ch or the sh sound the way he did. And it's because of his dyslexia that he was struggling with that. Phonics instruction is also very important. But I don't know if Hooked on Phonics is around anymore. I bought that for my daughter. That is not going to help. Because you need all of the principles together in order to successfully do it. Just learning the phonics isn't enough. And then syllable instruction. It's interesting because my background is mostly in Orton Gillingham instruction. So I didn't really realize that in traditional school, syllables aren't really taught. So this top one, does anyone know what kind of syllable that is? What's that? Yes, it's a closed syllable. And you guys being homeschool parents are probably much more aware than your average parent is. Okay, how about the next one? It could be considered two types of syllables. Can anyone tell me what one is? It's a silent E syllable. Yes. This is an example of breaking apart syllables. In Orton Gillingham instruction, number one, the key is visual. And number two, it's having all of the senses. So we want to introduce the kinesthetic, which is touch, tactile, auditory, listening, like telling the child what they need to learn in a very clear and concise manner. And then we also want them to re repeat back what they learned and what they understood. Now, not all Orton Gillingham programs are created equal. And a lot of homeschool families use all about reading and all about spelling. Now, it's better than nothing, okay? So if Orton Gillingham programs are not cheap, if that's all that's in your budget, that is better than nothing. However, it is not the best. It, and it's harder for parents because it's separated. First you're, reading, you're teaching them about reading and then you're teaching them about spelling. I primarily use Barton. I really like Barton. My daughter completed the Scottish Rite program in Texas. And when I, after I started tutoring my son, I made my daughter start working with me because I realized it wasn't as solid as Barton was. So the things I'm gonna tell you about are from my knowledge of Orton Gillingham through Barton. With Barton, we use tiles. And the tiles are different colors. But I brought the tiles. These are the actual tiles used from Barton. Now, my tutoring program is 100% online now. We've created tiles online. And they're still using, tact it's still tactile because they're moving it 
either with the mouse or if they have a touch screen, they're moving it with their fingers. But they need to be engaged, involved. And with anything, someone is gonna learn more, anything, they're gonna learn more from using at least two senses. So if you're teaching your kids science and you just lecture them about science and they don't ever get to do a science experiment, they may not remember it. I, I went to school and all we did was get lectured about science. And I went to private school, but that was all they provided. When I started homeschooling my kids, we did classical conversations for a year. And the kids did dissections and they remember it, you know? So it's the same thing. We want them to really be engaged in this. It's also like um, going to a, on a field trip. Your child is more apt to remember about American history if they go to a historical building and learn about it than if they're just hearing about it in a storybook. So anyway, um, back to separation of syllables. So we teach them how to divide the syllables. So this is a closed syllable. And they need to double the P before they add a suffix. So this is called the happy rule. And they get names for most of the rules to help them remember. And another really important thing is repetition. Repetition, repetition. What did I say? Repetition. Yes. They need to hear the information over and over again. Orangelinam is, in, in the traditional sense, is not ideal for your neurotypical learner because there's too much repetition for them. They're like, oh, I already heard this, Mom. I don't want to hear this again. But it's definitely what a dyslexic person needs. And so when we're working with the students, we review and we teach new information. We review and teach new information. And then this down here, this is a, a vowel team syllable. So, you know, vowel teams typically, the first vowel does the talking and the second vowel does the walk. So we teach them different tricks and rules to help them remember. And so rather than having to remember how to spell thousands of words, they only have to remember how to spell a couple of hundred rules. Not every rule is 100%, but you can figure about at least 80% of the time that rule will work. Do you know what these two words have in common? I'll tell you. They're sight words. And parents usually say, oh, they can't spell easy words, like what? Well, was is not an easy word. The, the A is not making any sound it should be making. They can't use phonics to help them remember that. Sight words have to be memorized. I can remember as a young girl, I could not spell this word. It was so embarrassing for so many years because I had no clue. You can't hear the I in that word. You can't hear any vowel in that word. You just have to memorize. Another really common challenge with dyslexia is they'll guess. Now look at the first letter. These letters, well these letters are the same. But look at the last letter, or the last three letters of these two words are the same. So to a dyslexic person trying to read, they can very easily mix up these two words. I'm sure many of you have seen this in your children. This is very common reading challenge. They can be small words, they can be big words. Was and saw. Um, but what happens is if they can't read the word correctly, then none of the context makes sense. And so then they can't even follow along what they read. They can't answer the question if parents ask, well, what did that, what did that paragraph say? Uh, it didn't make any sense. 
Well, you just read it three times. How does it not make sense? Because they're confusing these two words. Very often they'll say them wrong too. Like maybe in a conversation, they might say, oh, I don't have the continent to answer that question right now. And you're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but they really meant, I don't have the confidence, right? Another common thing that average people will figure out on their own is what sound the C should make or when to use a K and when to use a C. Well, dyslexic people very often have no clue. They'll spell words wrong. They'll use a K for cat or whatever. So we teach a rule called um, the cat and her kittens. And <laughs> that rule helps you know if a word is followed by if a C or a G, it's the same thing with G. If a C or a G is followed by an E, I, or Y, you're going to, it's gonna make a sound. Or the G is gonna make a J sound, like gentle or giraffe. But if it's, um, if it's not an E, I, or Y, we call those watch out vowels. And we teach them things like movements the girls like to go, watch out, vowels. And the boys, watch out, vowels. <laughs> we teach them these, and when they're involving their senses in remembering the rules, they're going to remember it better. So as they progress along in an organ healing half program, they're eventually going to learn suffixes and prefixes. This is a suffix. I couldn't think of any prefixes that would work with either of these words. I could have come up with other words, but I didn't. <laughs> so we teach them what the suffixes and prefixes mean. So they have meaning. So ness is the quality of. So the word cuteness is the quality of being cute. Lee is how. How did she do it? Cutely. So when they understand what the suffixes and the prefixes mean, that can help them to understand what they're reading in these big words. Unlike traditional teaching, where vowel E's are introduced in kindergarten, Orton Gillingham builds on itself. And so that's one of the key components, if not the biggest component, to Orton Gillingham-based instruction. It's beneficial when it's individualized. And a lot of times, charter schools or public schools or even private schools will have them do their instruction in a group setting because it's more cost effective. But the problem is, if someone's out sick, you can't move along. You have to wait for everyone to be there. And if someone doesn't understand, they may, may still be too embarrassed to say they don't understand, and the teacher will move along. So individualized instruction is the key. And it builds confidence, because they are learning in a way their brain understands. We have students who are older, who have been tutoring with other tutors, regular tutors in the past, and they're usually coming and they're like, I don't want to do another tutor. But within a week, they can see that they are finally being taught in a way that they understand. And it, because of the way the program is taught, it leads to long-term success. We're not just putting a band-aid on the problem. Within a couple of years of them doing an Orton Gillingham instruction, they are able to retain what they've learned. Like I said, my son by 10th grade was reading on an 11th grade level. I only taught him up to a seventh grade because we only got to level seven of birth. That's a seventh grade reading level. But by then, he had the confidence to continue to read and improve his reading skills. And if they practice reading, they're just going to keep getting better and better. Student of mine who was an online student before COVID, and she just did so great and I remember this was when I was still tutoring and she was like talking about how hard it was to be dyslexic and I'm like you know I'm dyslexic she's like what 
And it totally changed her perspective of things, knowing that she wasn't alone. Because very often, dyslexic people think they don't want to talk about their challenges, so they feel like they're the only ones in the world having those issues. Um, and then the second mom, she is a um, speech pathologist, and her daughter is a twin, and very often we'll have a twin, and the other twin doesn't have any challenges at all. So um, if you're dyslexic, about 50% of your kids will be dyslexic as well. My husband and I are both dyslexic, so 75% of our kids are. And then the last one, her son was unschooled. And I don't know how much unschooling happens in Northern California. I lived in Southern California when I was, most of the time I was homeschooling. There was a lot of unschooling there. And unschooling can be great for neurotypical kids. But in my opinion, for the child who has learning challenges, they're never going to have that desire to want to pick up a book and read. So her son was 20 years old when he started tutoring with us. He was probably on like a first grade reading level. And he didn't actually finish the program yet, but he put it on pause because he moved out and wanted to start his life. And, but we worked with a lot of unschooled kids. And one of my favorite stories was an unschooled girl that I tutored and she was on a third grade the reading level. And her mom didn't think she was dyslexic because she didn't reverse anything. And within 24 months, she was reading on a 10th grade reading level. She became a, um, a birthing, a doula. And you know, she, her life, she couldn't do anything without her mother there with her before that. Her mom went to volunteer with her because they wouldn't let her volunteer because she couldn't read and they were afraid. She wanted to volunteer at a cat sanctuary and they were afraid if she went to give medication, she might give the wrong medication. In conclusion, Orton Gillingham instruction is the key. And someone came up to me yesterday and asked me about Linda Moodbell. In my opinion, Linda Moodbell is not ideal for dyslexic people because it's a it's intense instruction for a very short period of time. And dyslexic people typically have memory issues. So their brain can't absorb all that information that quickly. It, it needs to be a slower process. Although they need consistency, they need to do Thor and Gillingham at least twice a week. If you're doing it yourself at home, if, you could do it four days a week, or at least plan four days a week, because hey, let's face it, something comes up, we want to go on a field trip, so if we plan four days a week, then they'll get instruction three days a week. Minimum two days a week. But they need at least two days a week to retain the information. Otherwise, it goes in one ear and out the other. So now, if you guys have any questions, about what you don't have instruction, multi-sensory math, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, I am happy to answer any of them. So you said that for neurotypical kids, this might be too redundant because of the repetition. Right. Um, is it only because of the repetition or is it? Yes. So is there a way that you could use it and then not repeat a couple of things or like maybe not? Or is it like, because you said it's um, reviewing what you did and then learning something new? So with Barton, we have a script. Okay. So it would be really hard to not repeat because it's written into the script. For another Orton Gillingham based program, absolutely. Okay. Because one of my tutors was trained in the traditional Orton Gillingham program, and so sometimes we have students once in a blue moon, who Barton doesn't work for them. And so she'll, she has to create her own curriculum. It's a lot more time consuming, uh, but that one, absolutely, you could do that. And probably all about reading and all about spelling doesn't have a script, really. It kind of tells you what to do. Um, so, so yes, you could do a different one that wouldn't be as repetitive. I really like all about reading. My daughter had a hard time reading. So at third grade level, she finally picked it up, and now she's reading about grade level. She'll read like Greek mythology, and it's 
like that. That's so awesome. And like I said, I mean, it's it's not it's not bad. It's, not it's just, it, and maybe she's not as severe as some students, you know. Yeah. So that can make a difference too. Yeah. 